Okay. So I want to talk you uh, talk uh, about some uh, um, consequences of the two theorems we have seen last time. In particular, the Schwarz lemma and Schwarz peak lemma. I recall that Schwarz lemma tells us something about functions which are holomorphic from the unit disk into itself. And such that 0 is a fixed point. So for this class of functions, of self maps of the unit disk, holomorphic self maps of the unit disk, we have this important consequence. That is that the distance from the origin of the image of any point is smaller or equal to the distance of this point, which is a contraction principle. Right? So assume that for instance you start from a point Z naught in general and you want to, st to study what are called the orbits of Z naught. So f of Z naught, f of f of Z naught and so on and so forth. Okay? Imagine that f is uh, a law which applies to some, some, to some uh, set, in this case the open disk. And you want to see what happens to the discrete okay, behavior of the orbits. Well, this property tells you that either the function keeps the distance from the origin fixed, the distance. So it means that it has the origin fixed and it can at most rotate, so change the argument but not the modulus. And this is in fact what the theorem tells you, right? Or the distance of f of z from the origin is smaller than this. So there is a contraction. And after repeating this procedure several times, then you see that f of f of z has a modulus which is smaller or equal to f of z, which is smaller. So eventually, so if you are not moving around a circle, a fixed distance from the origin, so if you are not taking f to be a rotation, then f contracts and maps the point up to the origin, which is a fixed point. So the limit point of the orbit is zero. This is important, say, in general, in mathematics, information. When you have a contraction and you know something about the estimate, how a map is pushed okay, towards a point, it is important to know. Okay? So, in some sense, Schwarz's peak lemma removes this hypothesis. So, consider just function holomorphic from a unit disk into itself. And with the use of the transitive properties of Möbius transformation, it resembles the, new, the same result but with a different feature, right? because of the presence of the, of the uh, composition of, with Mebius map transformation. So the result is like this. Right? For any pair of ZW in in the unit disk. And together with this estimate on F, on the modulus of F, there is also an estimate, in this case, this is the estimate of the derivative of F at zero, which is smaller in modulus smaller or equal to one. When it is one, then necessarily it is a rotation, right? The function is a rotation. Good. And here we have the similar estimate, which tells you the following.
right? Now the question is now how can we use this to find an analog of the contraction principle in the Schwarz? So the idea is to change the way of measuring the distance. So this is the standard Euclidean distance, right? This is the modulus of a vector in R2. If we introduce a new metric, right? So then, then we obtain a new uh, distance. We will see that according to this new distance, then the function which are holomorphic from unit disk into itself are in fact contraction for this distance. And I want to show you that this distance is not made uh, of uh, crazy ideas, but somehow intrinsic with the problem. Okay, this is a tough. In the meanwhile, let me just observe these uh, properties in another from another point of view. And assume that we want to see this in terms of um, um, an extremal problem. So you have a disk. You have the unit disk, and you have two points, Z and W. Okay. And you want to know which functions, which are holomorphic in the unit disk, which map Z and W, okay, are such that the derivative at Z is maximum. So you see Z naught and W naught, just to make. All right. So you want to say, okay. I have this information, the function maps Z0 into W0. Okay. Consider F from D into D holomorphic. F of Z0 is W0. Consider this class of functions, okay? Call it F Z naught, okay? And consider the modulus of F at Z naught, F prime at Z naught, right? And you want to ask, which, is there a supremum? Which kind of function do receive the supremum? So we're taking the supremum in F of Z naught, right? Well, the answer is yes, there is a supremum, and it is actually maximum, and the maximum is taken for F being uh, Möbius transformation, which is maximum, right? And this comes from this second inequality, okay? Well, F of Z is W naught, and F prime at Z naught is bounded, and the modulus is bounded by this ratio. One, okay, let me write this way. So we now have F prime of Z naught, small or equal one minus modulus of F of Z naught, all square, one minus modulus Z naught. Correct? So this is in fact W naught. This is true for any F. in this class because we are dealing with functions which satisfy the, the, the hypothesis of schwarz peak lehmann They are holomorphic in the unit disk into itself. That's it. In particular, we have this information, f of z naught is w naught, so that we can rewrite the second inequality given by schwarz peak lehmann in this way. But we also know that when the maximum is reached at a certain z naught, then necessarily f is a Möbius transformation. So we can see that this problem can be solved. It's a functional analysis problem, right? Say, give me a description of functions. Or is there any function which reaches the, mac the supremum? Because normal, you say in, in principle, this can be a supremum. Or well, I can say, no, this is a maximum, and this is taken for any holomorphic function, which is an automorphism mapping Z0 into W0, okay? So 
So, this, this is this solves an extremer problem. If you want to see the problem in terms of with the with the point of view of functional analysis, this theorem gives you important information, right? Similarly, in the case of a fixed point, so go back to Schwarz lemma. You want to know which of the function keeping zero fixed have the derivative of zero maximal, so in the sense of modulus, okay, which is maximal. Well. This happens to be just a case of rotations. Only rotation can have f prime of zero of modulus one. All the others have modulus smaller than one. Okay. So these are information or description of so extremal functions for some problems, describing this in these geometric terms. And this de depends on essentially on the maximum modulus, right? Because this is what we applied for the description and for the results, Schwarz and Schwarz peak lemma. This is, okay, just a small remark on functional analysis. Now, going back to the idea of introducing a new metric, okay, since we want to deal with the inequality in the which appear in Schwarz peak lemma, it is natural to consider as element of distance d s squared to be d z square over one minus modulus squared. This can be somehow surprising, but we can write it explicitly dz is dx plus i dy if z is x plus i y, right? So this is dx squared plus dy squared over 1 minus x squared minus y squared squared. All right? If you want to avoid this, normally the, 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 the element of the metric, the, this is the differential uh, expression of the metric, right? It's the square because we normally use the square, but if you want ds is module dz over 1 minus module z square, which means, and it is dx, so this is difficult to, to write, right? Plus x squared plus dy squared square root over 1 minus x squared minus y which of course agrees, it agrees with the standard distance at zero. You see there is a function here depending on the point z. So at each point of the unit disk, the way of measuring the length depends on the point. Okay? So that you can imagine to introduce a metric on the disk as considering a way of measuring something on the tangent, right? Because the tangent of the disk is the plane itself. And when you have, well, this is something which is from, it's natural to do in real differential geometry. You have, imagine a surface, and if the surface is not embedded in a, R3, but you want to put a way of measuring the length of tangent vectors at each point, you have to define this locally and then locally and com in compatible way with uh, the charts, a way of measuring the length of the tangent vectors using a function. In this case, this is a global way. Okay, this is general for any z. This is well defined for any z and the unit disk, because this number here is positive and finite. But what you see is that as soon as z tends to become closer to the boundary of the unit disk, so that its modulus is getting closer to 1, this number here tends to 0, so that d of s tends to be very big. Okay. 
So two points which are close according to Euclidean distance okay, can have very long, very large distance using this metric. Good. Now, assume that this is something artificial and I want just to say, okay, this is a way to measure something, okay? Let me justify the introduction of this, not as a, a concept, or say, not as a generalization of the contraction principle in Schwarz's lemma for function without the assumption that zero is fixed. So let me check which are the functions for this, which are uh, isometries for this metric. It means that it preserves the metric. Hmm? So take a general complex valued F, okay, from the unit disk and to C in general, complex valued function and write as usual the real and imaginary part of f as u and v respectively. Right? Good. So I want to say how can I characterize the isometries for this metric? So I have ds squared to be modulus of dz squared over 1 minus modulus of z squared squared and I say uh, how Uh, how can I characterize isometries for this metric? The answer is, well, and just make calculations. I have no assumption on F. Look, F is not holomorphic necessarily. F is just complex valued. I have distance and I want to see something from the geometry point of view. Well, keep the distance. Keep the distance in between points means keep the metric because then I have to integrate the distance, the, the metric to have the distance, right? So my idea is to consider, well, all these functions are, have to satisfy this. So F is an isometry for the S if and only if they preserve the isometry. They preserve the, sorry, they preserve the metric. So it preserves, preserves the way of measuring locally, so this is a differential way, no? locally the distance. Good. Pardon me? No, I'm, I'm not assuming, sorry, I'm not assuming that F has any other geometric problem, but that the function has, to, well, it has to be at least differentiable, okay? So the components have to be at least C1, hmm? but not necessarily satisfying any other relation, so not, nothing like a CR equation or anything else. So well, what we'll see is surprising that if you request, if your request is that this metric is preserved, then necessarily Cauchy-Riemann equations are satisfied or anti cauchy riemann equations are satisfied, okay? Let me just show you how it comes from calculation. There is no extra motivation. So what is this? Numerator here. Here is dx squared plus dy squared, right? What is here? Have u Okay, F is U plus I V, right? So DF is the U plus I D V. So DF is modulus as D U squared plus D V squared. So what is D U? D U is u x d x plus u y d y. This is real analysis, right? And d y and d v is 
Vx dx plus Vy dy. Therefore, when I consider du squared plus dv squared, I have okay, ux squared dx squared plus vx squared dx squared plus plus uy squared dy squared plus vy squared dy squared plus so I put together on the same line the uh, elements with the same okay in the same in the same uh, the, over the same type say dx squared dx squared dy squared dy squared then I will also have two ux uy dx dy plus two vx vy dx dy okay so this is This is u y squared plus v y squared d y squared, right? This is d f modules of d f squared, right? So I have this as a condition. Right. So here, the numerator is this plus, and the denominator is this. Okay. On the left hand side, the numerator is like this. So this implies that this and this have to be the same because here they have the same coefficient, and this has to be zero because the x dy on the right hand side is not appearing. So that the two condition, the, this condition implies that ux squared plus vx squared is uy squared plus vy squared. And ux uy plus vx vy is equal to 0. All right? Well, notice that I'm not saying that this has to be 1. This number here comes out as 1 minus modulus of f of z squared squared over 1 minus z squared squared, but it doesn't really care. I mean, this has to be the same as this, which implies, actually, this is equivalent. So try to solve this problem. Okay, so if you add or if you subtract, you obtain something like ux is equal to minus 1 to the power n vy, and uy is minus vx. Okay, so it, it is either 1 and minus 1 here, which means that Cauchy Riemann sat are satisfied, these are the Cauchy Riemann's equation, or Minus 1 appears here and plus 1 appears here, so that anti Cauchy Riemann, as they call So the function, instead of being holomorphic, are anti holomorphics. Okay? Instead of, of solving d bar z equal to 0, it's d z equal to 0. So somehow, what I, I have here is that, well, if you want to preserve the metric and you are a holomorphic, and they are complex value function, then as I said, you are the function you are considering are holomorphic or anti-holomorphic. Okay, this is Cauchy-Riemann or anti-Cauchy-Riemann equations. So that, this is Um, 
position any function, any complex valued function which is an isometry for the S is necessarily holomorphic or anti holomorphic. This holomorphic satisfies equations. Yes, it satisfies anti. So, sin just minus okay, appears in the reverse position, <laughs> anti cauchy riemann equations. And this is something quite surprising, I would say, right. So, a geometric condition you put, you can, you can see this entirely in real terms. So, you have a function from R2 to R2, you define an uh, uh, differential metric and you can write it in terms of the x and the y, right? Well, if you want this to be pres this metric to be preserved, that is to say that the function is an isometry, then necessarily additional conditions equivalent to holomorphicity or anti-holomorphicity are satisfied. Okay. Now, how you define a distance from a metric. So, as I said, in say in in um, complex in sorry in uh, real differential geometry, what you have is a way to measure the length of a vector on the tangent space. So, in order to measure a distance according to this way of measuring the length of the vectors tangent to the surface. You consider a curve connecting these two points on the surface. Okay. Since you have a way to measure the length of the vector's tangent to the surface, then you can measure the length of the curve according to this way. How? By integrating this rectifiable curve on the surface and measuring the distance between two points using the distance, so the length of the curve. Since you have the, the measure of the modulus of the tangent, you integrate this and you have the length of the curve. A rectifiable curve is okay, the, the distance, the distance, the, the length of a curve is in for a rectifiable curve is defined like this. So how you define in a this this is just one possibility. If you change the curve, of course, in, in principle the distance changes obviously, right? You have several possibilities, then you take the infimum, because the distance has to have some infimum properties. And so you define, take Z1 and Z2, two points, and the this similarly, the distance, which will be denoted in this way, as the infimum on gamma, gamma connecting Z1, gamma, rectifiable curve in delta, uh, connecting Z1 to Z2. And well, this is, right, the distance the S, because we define the S to be what you know as the, well, the S means uh, exactly what I said, right? We have a metric and we integrate over a curve. So, we have to put the modulus of gamma prime, so passing through 
to the standard change with the parameter, gamma is a curve, this is the distance. And this distance is, in fact, an important distance. It, it is a name. It's a Poincaré distance and d. So can you calculate this distance explicitly, just to give you an idea what happens? OK. So yes, we can. This is, OK, the, again, the infimum over gamma of what? Of dz modulus dz1 minus modulus z squared. This is. Well, dz here is well, what contains the information, the tangent. And here is the function which defines the way of measuring the length. So the closer the point is to the boundary, the bigger this, uh, this way of measuring becomes. Okay? But it's a distorted way. It's not like the standard distance. And imagine this Escher uh, pictures of the, you know, the same triangle and then which, which becomes apparently smaller and smaller, but the distance is preserved actually, okay, in this in this way. You know this these kind of pictures which appears in some book in some by Cornelius Escher, he's a famous artist. He made such a, a game, okay, by repeating the same triangle, okay, keeping the distance, and so the the, the triangle becomes smaller and smaller for what we see, but they are in fact this, with the same distance of points using this Poincaré distance. Well, it doesn't really matter. Now I I want to show you how this, if you're not familiar with Escher, uh, never mind. Uh, I want to show you how you can calculate, okay? So we, we make some very simple examples. And the example is the following. Start from zero and take z, okay? So I want to measure the distance from zero to point z. And it is using this definition. So I have to take the integral over any curve connecting zero to z mm, and take the infimum of all these distances. This is the general definition. But we observe that, well, in this metric, nothing changes if you rotate z. So the distance from zero to z is the same. Of the distance from any point on the same circle centered the origin and of modulus modulus of z. Because if you replace with z with z, pro, z uh, star being e i theta z, well, nothing changes here and here. So in particular, I will consider the case which is easy to handle, the case where z is in fact on the real axis. Okay? I have the freedom of choosing any z and I take this z because the definition I, I have taken for the this for the metric is independent for rotations. Therefore this is as I said the infimum over gamma of what? dz over 1 minus z squared, right? And I show you this, that this is in fact the integral between 0 and modulus of z of what? Of dt y. So among all possible curves connecting z, starting starting in zero and ending at modulus of z which is a real number i can always take the segment on the real axis hmm? or observe that the real of z is smaller or equal to modulus of z right and also the square of this because modulus of z is smaller than 1 good so the the distance k 
can be in fact defined in this way, taking the infimum, that is to say this is the infimum. So am I able to integrate this function, real value function, over an interval? Well, this depends on our skills in calculus. <laughs> so assume that you are, say, a first year student and you have to solve this problem. Find a primitive function, say, of this function here. Everything is real, right? Can we solve this? Yeah, okay. Some of, some of you can solve it. I want to see uh, how do you solve this. Okay, you know, okay, that this is something related to, to a hyperbolic tangent, the inverse of the hyperbolic tangent. Okay, but I, I don't want to go into, say, very uh, uh, obscure terminology. I've never introduced anything which is uh, hyperbolic sinus, sinus, and cosinus. So it would be strange that now I start introducing the inverse function of the hyperbolic tangent. Is it possible to use simply logarithm? <laughs> Which is in fact related to this. Okay, so the idea is as usual to, to split this in okay, 1 minus t, okay, times 1 plus t. And this becomes as a 1 minus t plus b 1 plus t. And I have to find a and b, right? All right, are you, so I guess that all of you have uh, at least once in your life seen this kind of uh, integral student, okay? And then I, I, well, from this I've obtained that a minus b is equal to zero because a minus b is the coefficient of t. And on the left hand side, t is not appearing on the numerator, whereas a plus b has to be one because it is the coefficient of uh, t to the power zero, if you want, right? So from this, what I obtain is that, the one, uh, that a is one half and b is minus one half. I'm sorry, well, it's one half as well, sorry. Correct? Therefore, the integral I'm looking for becomes, so, one half the integral of one over one minus t dt plus one half integral plus t dt, and therefore have well this uh, this uh, is easily recognized readily seen that this is this the primitive of this is log of one plus t, and here is minus log of 1 minus t, right? Therefore, I have 1 half log of 1 plus modulus of z over 1 minus modulus of z. Okay? Are you okay? Okay. Now, <coughs> What I observe here is that while well, this number becomes, well, I'm s I take this notation. Okay. This is a division. It's a, well, a subtraction of two. This is the logarithm of this, one half in a, minus the logarithm of one minus this, and then I write it in a, in, in, in as logarithm of the well I write it this way also if you wish equivalently what I observe here is that this function is well this is a real value function right this is the, the real logarithm this is a real uh, number, and this is the real logarithm. Well, this is monotone 
increasing with u. That is to say, if u1 is smaller than u2, log the, of 1 plus u1 minus uh, over 1 minus u1 is smaller than log. Okay, this is if you or either you trust me or you can see this. Well, this is easily seen because, well, take, you can use standard tools in real analysis, so take the derivative, it's this, okay, which is positive, so. It's 1 over 1 minus u squared, which is positive because u is smaller than 1, okay? This is the primitive of this function, so 1 over 1 minus u squared is a derivative of this function here, correct? Which is positive. So the function is increasing. And this is what we need to prove that, in fact, holomorphic functions are contracted by the Poincare distance. In fact, I have this. Look. This is number 8. This is number 9. First, observe that we have just calculated the distance, the, uh, the Poincaré distance, between 0 and any point Z. Is it enough to conclude something? Yes, it is. Because we know that the um, Mebius transformation are trans acts transitively on the disk, and they are preserving what? Precisely this metric. So as I put a remark here, take phi in, okay, an automorphism. Uh, f f okay, okay. M D acts transitively in on say the disk. That is to say, for any pair of points, and that is there exist phi in M of D such that phi of Z is W. Right? And we also have that d phi calculate this d phi squared okay over one minus modulus of phi of z squared is d z squared over one minus modulus of d squared because okay d phi of z is phi prime of z d z right and we have that v prime of z 1 minus since v is an automorphism so in general we have inequality here less or equal but the, since we are starting from an automorphism we have an equality here so once again the automorphism, holomorphic automorphism, preserve uh, the metrics so they are isometries. So you can see this directly. Okay. And with the previous calculation, we showed that these are the only holomorphic functions which preserve the uh, Poincare metric and are, in fact, isometries for this metric. Because of this, I can always reduce my problem to the following. So take any two points, Z and W, in the unit disk, and take phi, uh, maybe it's transformation in the unit disk, such that phi of Z is zero. It acts transitively. I map Z into zero, and well, who cares? Phi of W is some other point in the unit disk. Then I calculate 
the Poincaré distance between Z and W, keeping in mind the previous remark, that is to say that the distance is the same if I consider any two pair of points mapped by a Mabius transformation, because Mabius transformations are in fact isometries. So in particular this is as omega of phi of z, phi of w. But phi of z is chosen in such a way that this is zero. And I have the freedom of choosing this because the automorphism act transitively. So I can always set, uh, map one point to the origin and the other to somewhere, somewhere else, which I call w. And this is what I can explicitly write in this way. Logarithm of 1 plus modulus of phi of w over 1 minus modulus of phi of w. And since I have that phi of z is 0, I can also say, well, this is our function. So I have w minus z over 1 minus z bar w to be modulus of phi of w. So I have explicitly written the distance of any two points. Maybe, well, it can be misleading that z appears to be as a constant. So, but let us put z naught here, z naught, and I have z naught here. So, I have this z naught, z naught bar here, all right? So, this is the distance. And since we know that, look, f of z minus f of w over 1 minus f of w bar f of z is smaller or equal of z minus w over 1 minus w bar z for any z and w in delta and f holomorphic from the unit disk into itself. From here, you can see that what I'm doing here is that I'm considering I'm considering this. I have phi of f of w of f of z, okay, which is And on the other hand, I have V of W, Z modulus, which is Z minus W bar, W, sorry, over 1 minus W bar Z, correct? This is another way to rewrite the statement of schwarz peak lemma. But then, I have that this number is smaller than this. Okay, so that I have that the distance, Poincare distance between f of z and f of w, which is expressed as one half logarithm of one plus phi of f of w, f of z minus. Because this function as a real valued function is monotone increasing and this number is greater than or equal to this, this is smaller or equal to one half the logarithm of one plus modulus of phi w z over one minus modulus of phi w z, which is precisely omega of z w. So here we finally have the contraction property of holomorphic functions for this metric, which is important. Okay, this is a model, and as we'll see, it is not just by chance a model to be, to be chosen. It is a model, well, if you want to investigate a bit more in detail this geometry associated to the uh, metric we have introduced so far, 
you can prove that this is a, a model of hyperbolic geometry. In fact, the curvature, for those of you who know what it means, the curvature is constant negative. So even though we are looking at what is a disk, well, with this metric, it would be like something which is hyperbolic. So this is a model of uh, non-Euclidean geometry. And what we have here is that, well, this, in this non-Euclidean geometry, holomorphic functions are contractions and isometries are automorphies. So finally, let me just give you what it is a simple geometric uh, descriptions of things in this ge geometry. So, and this is 12, right? Good. So, I want to consider in the unit disk a portion of a circle which is orthogonal to the boundary of the disk. Well, two curves are said to be orthogonal if the tangents at this point, at this point, at the, at the intersecting point, are in fact orthogonal. Okay, so what I'm considering here is something which is like this, where, okay, this is, so the tangent to the curve I'm considering, to the circle I'm considering is parallel to the ray. Okay. So take a complex number C whose modulus is greater than 1. And let us describe this circle in terms of the standard equation, say, this, say that's a distance from the point C. Okay? This is C, and I want to describe the circle, C, circle, uh, orthogonal to the boundary of the unit disk. This is zero, and this ray has length one. Okay. So I take this, this. What I have here is that, well, I can describe this circle in this way. The distance from C is this, right? Distance square. Hmm? And this is modulus of C minus 1. Modulus of C squared minus 1. Okay? You see this? Well, modulus of C is this. This is 1. Modulus of C squared is this minus 1, which is this. Okay? Good. So I define C in terms of. this equation, and this describes the set of points which are on C and in D. Okay? So that, well, I can also make this condition more explicit. I write it as modulus of C squared plus modulus of C squared minus 2 real part of C bar Z equal to modulus of C squared minus 1 or modulus of z squared minus 2 real part of c bar z plus 1 equal to 0. Good. 
So, I can describe all such circles using these equations. So, this is the equation of the portion of a circle orthogonal to the boundary, as of course C as modulus greater than 1. And in particular, uh, among all uh, other cases, we can also consider the case where C tends to infinity, which is well affected this as a diameter. Hmm? Diameter is also somehow. A limit position of this of this form. Hmm? Good. Now what I want to see is that that if F is an automorphism of the unit disk, then F of C is a C prime. So an automorphism, so an isometry for the metric, keeps circle orthogonal to the boundary of the unit disk. So it keeps map circle orthogonal to the boundary and onto circle orthogonal to the boundary, and possibly being also the case of uh, diameters. Let us see how. So take well first f. F is a rotation which represents a subgroup of the group of automorphism. Rotation centered at the origin, well, this is obvious. Okay, so obvious if F is a rotation uh, of center. So we can consider f of z to be a transformation like this. Okay, without the the rotational term, because if it is a rotation, it's obvious. If you rotate everything, and you have something which is orthogonal, then you have something which is orthogonal somewhere else. But it is okay. And let me make this calculation. Instead of considering the image, I consider f minus 1 of z. And I assume that this is on the circle c. Okay. And then I want to prove that this is possible if and only if z is on a circle. Okay? Equivalently, just to make less calculation as as less calculation as I can. Okay, that's why I prefer this expression because f minus one of z is z minus z naught over one minus z naught bar z, which is more familiar. So I use this here. Good, and what is this? Well. We cannot avoid men, not avoid calculation. We have to make these calculations. Okay, so just okay. This is this over one minus z naught bar z minus two real part of c hat. Then I have z minus z naught bar. Sorry, z minus z naught over one minus z naught bar z plus one. Okay, then I remember that one minus z naught bar z modulus square is nothing but one minus z naught bar z times its conjugate. So it is one minus z naught z bar. So that if I multiply everything, well, this is zero, right? If I multiply everything times modulus of one minus z naught z squared. I cancel this, cancel, so I cancel this, and I and I, it will appear here only this term inside the real part, right? And I have to then multiply one times one minus z naught z modulus squared. So 
I have finally z minus z naught module squared minus 2 real part of c bar and then I have z minus z naught and 1 minus z naught z bar ok as I said ok plus 1 minus z naught bar z square equal to 0 ok. So, I multiplied everything times 1 minus uh, uh, the module squared of 1 minus z naught bar z which is not 0 as we all know or should know ok. Good. So, I make these calculations and I remember that this is modulus of z squared plus modulus of z naught squared minus 2 real part of z naught bar z ok. Then I keep the other term here fixed in some sense, but I multiply what is inside. So, I have z minus z naught modulus of z squared, then I have minus z naught right and then minus plus z naught squared z bar and then I have finally plus 1 plus modulus of z naught squared plus modulus of z squared. Well, I can omit the bar because ok the modulus is the same and minus 2 real part of z naught bar z equal to 0. So, this is like this ok. So, I have modulus of z squared plus modulus z naught squared plus 1 plus z naught squared times z modulus of z squared. Then I can put this real part inside of this right. Then I have plus minus actually minus 2 real part of then c hat z right minus c hat z naught modulus of z squared minus c <coughs> hat z naught minus c uh, hat c bar sorry z naught squared z bar and then I have minus 2 z naught bar z plus yes because the minus in front now for 2 because I have 2 right and 2 right. This is uh, plus thank you all right ok. Ok, so I notice that here I can also have what this is c z naught c bar z naught times minus ok plus z squared. Let me check this is correct right and here I can this is equal to 0 right and this part here can be written as 1 plus modulus of z square times uh, let me see 1 plus z naught is it 1 plus z naught square plus z bar square plus right. So, that I factor out this term from here and from here in such a way that I continue on this new piece of paper and I have 1 plus modulus of z squared times 1 plus modulus of z naught squared which is this and then I have uh, minus then I say plus right 2 real part of 
z hat z naught. Right? Is it? Because this is a real number, then I can take from the real part. So the coefficient is minus c z naught, minus 2 is in front, this is 2 c bar z naught times 1 plus z squared. Then plus, minus, sorry, minus 2, real part of the rest, which is c bar z, then I have plus 2 c naught bar c uh, let me see G, uh, c bar z sorry I forgot plus c hat z naught bar z naught squared and that's it right one two three one two three Is it correct? C bar z. Then I have 2 z naught bar z and then I have z bar z naught square. This is what is left after, after uh, putting this term in this part here. Okay? Now, what can, what can we have here? Well, first case, assume that 1 plus z naught squared plus 2 real part z bar z naught is different from 0. This is a real number, and it can be different from 0 or equal to 0. If it is different from 0, then we can rewrite this condition in this way. I have uh, we can divide, right? So I have 1 plus modulus of z squared plus minus 2 real part of uh, what is here? Yes. It is something like this, right? C Z not bar. Is it appearing here? Sorry. Z bar. C Z not bar. So what is missing is this, right? You probably w wanted to point it out is that I forgot a z bar here. So I have, well, that this is the situation. I have c bar z plus 2 z naught bar z plus z bar z naught squared z bar over 1 plus modulus z naught squared plus 2 real part z hat z naught. And this is equal to 0 which has the same aspect as 1 plus real part minus 2, sorry, real part of c tilde z plus modulus of z squared equal to 0. Well, c tilde comes out from this. That is to say that is z is in c prime with a c tilde with as a center. Mm -hmm. The second possibility left is the following. So I have, well, if 1 plus modulus of z naught squared minus 2 real part of c hat z naught is 0, this is equivalent to saying that, well, this number, well, it is a plus here, right? Z naught minus Z naught is uh, in C. 
you see, because it satisfies the condition. Or, since f of z is z plus z naught, 1 plus z naught bar z, that is to say, uh, f of min minus 1 of 0 is z naught, right? Because 0 is mapped into z naught by f, f minus 1 of 0 is z naught. Oh, sorry, f of z, if, sorry, as I said, f of minus 1 of z naught is 0 or f of uh, f of sorry minus e naught is zero so f of uh, f minus one of zero is minus z naught that's more convincing which means that well f minus one of zero belongs to c good good so, if this is the case, what is left is that we have, uh, from the previous calculation, we have that uh, the real part of c hat plus c z naught bar squared plus 2 z naught bar c is equal to 0. And the previous, co the previous equation, okay, we had this left. The first part is 0 because the term 1 plus modulus of z squared is 0, the, the term, the coefficient of 1 plus. And so what is left is here. And this is what? This is a line in D passing through the origin. Which means it is a diameter. So in both cases, what we conclude is that any portion of circle orthogonal to the boundary is mapped into portion of the circle orthogonal to the boundary is mapped by a, a, an automorphism or a diameter which represents again a circle tangent. Well, this is the geometric property which leads to these conditions this condition, these observations. This is 14, this is, uh, sorry, 14, 15, this is 16, right? So for this metric, the geodesics are, so conclusions, circles in D orthogonal. So this is Euclidean, huh? Euclidean. Orthogonal to the boundary of D are preserved by the isometries of the Poincaré. metric. So for those of you familiar with this terminology, the portion of circles orthogonal to the boundary are in fact the geodesics for this curve. So if you want to find the minimal, the curve which realizes the minimal distance connecting two points using this metric, then you have to take the circle orthogonal to the boundary passing through these two points. And it's not surprising that when you restrict the case to the real axis, when we have already done this, we didn't make any mistake because, in fact, on the real axis, what we have is that, well, the connecting points are, in fact, on the diameter, which is uh, the, the connecting path minimizing the distance is, in fact, the, di the, the portion of, of diameter, which is, okay, so in this in this um, this geometry, if you want a triangle, becomes well three portions of like this, three portions of part of circles 
orthogonal to the boundaries, and this is a tri triangle. This is, you see, the uh, hyperbolic shape of a triangle, if you want. Okay. Normally, it is seen on what is more familiar, probably. You have uh, uh, an hyperbola, and you rotate it, and you have a model of hyperbola using, say, a uh, surface. But here we are in the flat stuff, and this is what you have. Okay? Thank you. Good. So in the last five minutes, I just want to uh, to make a short, very short observation and remark. So this is 16, 14, 15. So we have applied several times the properties of the automorphism of the unit disk. Okay. Um, but we have also the class of automorphism in the plane and in the Riemann sphere. Let me just point out some fact about fixed points of, of um, automorphism. So if you remember, we have this class of automorphism in the plane with A different from zero, right? So the question is, are this transformation always without fixed points or sometimes without fixed points. So we know, for instance, that we have translations and translations are without fixed points. But we also have here dilation and rotation. So for instance, if B is zero necessarily, while well, the origin is fixed. Hmm? So the question in general is, what are the fixed points sets for out C, out C hat, and out D. Okay? So, in other words, I want to describe which subclasses of automorphism have or do not have fixed point. And if I can characterize them, so, in the case of automorphism of the plane, well, we have to solve such an equation, which obviously has a solution if A is equal, is different from 1. Because you have that this is Z A minus 1 minus B, and if A is different from 1, then we have that this Z is V over 1 minus A. So, a fixed point exists if and only if A is not 1. Well, if, if B is 0 and, and, uh, uh, and uh, mm, sorry, yes, if B is 0 and A is 1, well, necessarily all points are fixed because we have then the identity. Huh? But if B is different from 0, we have just one fixed point. And of course, A is to be different from 1. If A is equal to 1, there is no fixed points for any B. Except, yeah, for any B. So. Now, what about the case of linear fractional transformation? Right? So we have to solve an equation like this, which becomes quadratic equation, right? So it is a, qu a quadratic equation if c is not 0. So it becomes a c z squared plus d minus a z minus b equal to 0, right? dz minus dz. Okay. So this is quadratic unless c is different from 0. 
unless z is in, sorry unless c is equal to zero. But if c is equal to zero, we go back to the previous case, right? Because with them we have automorphism of the plane, so we know okay everything. But if c is different from zero, then there is a fixed point, a pair of fixed points. Okay. In other words, there is no automorphism of the Riemann sphere without fixed points. And finally, we have the case of the Mabius transformation. And also in this case, since this maybe it's not so it can be considered a special cases of linear fraction transformation. We have a quadratic condition, but surprisingly, not any maybe it's not so it have a fixed point because we are restricting a set, right? <laughs> so this is the condition. Which becomes okay, becomes okay. Yes, z naught bar z squared plus z e i theta minus one minus z naught e i theta equal to zero. It's quadratic unless z naught bar is zero, but if z naught bar is zero, look, if z naught bar is zero, then we have a rotation, and a rotation is obviously zero as a fixed point. So we can assume z naught bar z naught bar to be different from zero. Therefore, this is the last things I'm going to tell you today. Therefore, we want to look for the zeros of this polynomial, so the roots, right? And so this can be approached in this way. So the modulus of P of Z is, of course, greater or equal to zero. It, it is zero precisely when z is a root, right? So this is smaller or equal to what? To the, the sum of what? Of z naught and well if I find a z such that its module satisfy this equation then necessarily this is zero and this is zero. In fact, I'm interested more in the modules than in the, what is precisely the zero. And I observe that the coefficient of the, the quadratic part and this of the zero, zero, zero degree term are the same. So that the two roots have modulus. This alpha is modulus of z1 and beta is modulus of z2. The two roots of which of course exist because we are in C are such that the, the, they are one the reciprocal of the other because the modulus of z1 times the modulus of uh, z2 are such that, well, it corresponds to the quotient z0 modulus of z0 time over modulus z0, which is 1, which means that either one is in the, so one of the solution has modulus smaller than one and the other is greater than 1, or both has, have modulus equal to 1. I'm not saying that they are always distinct. But okay. If they are distinct and of modules, of different modules, one is inside, so there can be one fixed point and the other is outside, or there are none in the unit disk and they are on the boundary. And they can be distinct or coincident. 
okay. And this will be used later on in our discussion. So I stop here and I thank you for your attention.